and they had no secrets from each other except for one. The woman kept in her closet a shoebox that she absolutely forbade her husband from ever opening. But she, when she was on her deathbed, and with her blessing, he opened that box and found a crocheted doll and $95,000 worth of cash. My mother told me that the secret to a happy marriage was to never argue, she explained to her husband. Instead, I should keep quiet and crochet a doll. Her husband was touched. Only one doll was in the box. That meant that she'd been angry with him only once in 60 years. But what about all this money, he asked. Oh, she said, that's the money I made from selling the dolls. <laughs> Today, uh, I brought something visual to add to my message today, and uh, some people might be tempted to say that only old-timers will remember using a typewriter, uh, manual or electric, but uh, I don't think that's exactly true, because I, how many of you have learned to type on something like this, reading something old, right? I mean, I could sit here and, uh, and type out the doxology pretty quick.
the phrase, everyone will know, suggests that love for Jesus, uh, the love for which Jesus is calling, is kind of a haptic feedback. Something substantial that lets not only the recipients of the loving action, but also those who witness it, know that they are in the presence of a follower of Christ Jesus. When uh, Ira Gillette, I think is how you pronounce her last name, who was a missionary to East Africa, returned home to report on his activities overseas, he related a very interesting phenomenon that he saw. Repeatedly, Gillette noticed how groups of Africans would walk right past the government hospitals and travel many extra miles to receive medical treatment at the missionary compound. And finally, he asked a particular group why they would walk the extra distance when the same treatments were available <clears throat> at the government clinics. And you know what they said? They said the medicines may be the same, but the hands. And I know that we've probably experienced the same thing, especially when we've sought after medical care or perhaps some other care. It's the hands, isn't it, that make all the difference. That's the virtue of love incarnated. It's the kind of love it's that kind of love that makes a difference. Christ has no hands but our hands, someone has said, no feet but our feet. We are his ambassadors, representing him to the world. And when we love as he loved us, it will make a difference. People will notice Christian love is indispensable. In addition, this love is also to be sort of a haptic feedback to be his disciples, Jesus said, after he's no longer present with them. Because previously, when Jesus talked about love, he was talking about that love our neighbor sort of love that's reflected in the Sermon on the uh, Good Samaritan parable, for example. This love extended outward from the circle of believers to whoever was in need, to whoever we found along the road in the ditch of life. Here, though, Jesus' focus is on commanding the disciples to love one another. In other words, he's telling them that when they act in loving ways toward each other in the community, they will reflect his love for them. And remember, early in the evening, before Jesus even launched into this commandment, he washed the disciples' feet to illustrate personally for them that loving someone means that they should be serving someone else. Love in Scripture, if you do a word study on it, you will find that it is never just an emotion. There was a man who one time spoke to a group of high schoolers about the idea of love. Don't you think that would be a great place to talk about love? Someone define love, he said. No response. Doesn't anyone want to give it a try? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody know that movie? You know, it's going to be on the big screen next month. Cinemark. They're going to be showing Ferris Bueller's Day Off on May 14th and 18th. I'm thinking about one. No response. Tell you what, the professor said. I'll define it, and you raise your hands if you think you agree, okay? And there were nods all around the room. Okay, love is that feeling you get when you meet the right person. Every hand in the room went up. And that's how many people approach the idea of love. Consciously or unconsciously, they believe that love is a sensation or a feeling that just spontaneously, spontaneously is generated when Mr. or Mrs. Wright shows up. And many just as easily, since they believe in this love, they've found that it can just spontaneously disappear as well when the magic isn't there anymore. You fall in love, you can fall out of love. But true love binds itself one to another, and true love serves. In effect, Jesus was creating a group it wasn't known as the church yet, but it would be later known as the church, whose primary mark is that we love each other, even expressing that in service to one another. Beyond that, our, the church can be as diverse in ethnicity, gender, language, nationality, age, political persuasion, just about any other box that we would put anybody in. But the disciples love one another John explains it elsewhere, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The 
That's 1 John 4, 21. And Jesus himself said, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Love says a lot about a community like the church. It marks those who express such love as followers of Jesus. So how does this play out with disciples today? Is the presence of Jesus recognizable among us in ways from the ways we love one another in the faith community? And we know, unfortunately, that there are plenty of tales from church life. You find these in the funny papers all the time that illustrate the opposite. There was once an adult Sunday school class with a shrinking membership that was asked to move to a smaller room to make way for a growing class that needed more room. They needed the space. The group refused. It was their space, and they weren't moving away anytime soon. And you know, there are plenty of people who have had a bad experience somewhere along the way. If we're taking any risks to share God's love at all, it won't take long to run into somebody like that. We unsuspectingly ran into somebody about 10 days ago as part of putting on the mop spaghetti dinner. This person called us robbers and thieves before the whole thing was over and said she should have known better than to even try to trust the church. She always referred to the church with a capital C, not talking about any particular church, but her problem, as she voiced it, was with the larger church. Somewhere along the line, she'd been betrayed. Somewhere along the line, if she had any trust, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't counted on. And it seemed like she may have been looking for an excuse to deepen that, uh, that feeling toward the church, but whatever. But let's not discount the good work that the church is doing. And even as we do fumble sometimes with the concept of carrying Christ's love, <coughs> let's remember that congregations often manage to put up with and work around or calm disruptive members, things that most businesses wouldn't even begin to tolerate. And it shows that we've learned something about trying our best to love one another with the Spirit's power, even, even loving some of those among us worshiper and family who are harder to love than others. Let's not forget that many children got their first real understanding that they might have something meaningful to offer the world when we as the church family praised them for the role that they had maybe in a Christmas pageant or some other, maybe a solo they sang in church or a musical offering on the piano. Some teenagers heard their calling to be disciples of Jesus through the example of a youth leader or maybe a mission trip while attending church camp on a congregational scholarship, or simply because of the acceptance that they found within their church when some things weren't going so well for them at home. And let's not forget the funeral dinners, or visits to the homebound for lay people, emergency but quiet gifts of financial assistance when people had a sudden need, prayers for one another during a time of intense grief or a time of concern or illness, Strong friendships between members who wouldn't have even met, perhaps, if they hadn't been a part of a local body of Christ. You know, I was uh, thinking about this the other day and, and remembering back to the time, those exciting days when Christine and I were expecting our first child, Nathan. He was coming along in a few moments. We, like many couples, went to one of those classes, you know, helped prepare you for childbirth and the false labor and all these things. And, and I remember just having a certain joy within in me as we were surrounded by other folks who were going through that similar experience at that time. I don't remember anybody from that class, but there was a certain camaraderie among us as we were together, and we were, for the most part, learning for this for the first time. And I was thinking, you know, many people probably have resources in their family to just go through it, not ever have to go to a class like that. They can just it on their own and be fine. And it's just the same way that some folks think, I don't need a church. I don't need a church family to enjoy a relationship with God. And maybe that in some way that they, that's true. And yet, what about the joy we get of being a part of this family of Christ? That joy would not be theirs. Some followers of Jesus, we know, help people by babysitting when the regular babysitter doesn't show up. They fill in for a caregiver so she or he can have some downtime. There's just so many things that the church does get right. And within the church, the body of Christ, we also find disciples offering truth in love to one another 
even when the truth might be painful. We share it because Jesus hasn't called us just to be nice. He's called it to be truly loving. And that means that sometimes we have to confront one another in love. And sometimes we get to disagree in love. Isn't that great? But that's what Jesus has called us to. That's why when difficult questions come along that require difficult decision making and challenging decision making, the first question I want to make sure is not neglected, not neglected is, what does love require here? What is the loving response? Because I believe in the end that's what we're going to be judged to see whether we follow it. Jesus said it was a new commandment indicating it's not optional for Christians. Love begins when we open ourselves up, when we're willing to be vulnerable with others and we're willing to be open to them. Now that's not easy to do, is it? We might say, I'm not going to do that. Somebody might not like me. Who, who here likes the idea of somebody not liking me? Well, we probably don't care for that too much. But uh, guess what? Is it possible for everybody you meet to like you? Is it possible for a little league heater to go out there and hit every ball that's pitched to him? No. Probably going to miss more than he ever cracks the bat and hits. That's just how it works. In practice now, we know though that while we may be able to serve each other without hesitation, we are likely to be able to have that. And we know this is true. We're not going to have the same level of fellowship with everyone. That is also impossible. Years ago, there was a Quaker writer, Thomas Kelly, who wrote, No single person can hold all dedicated souls within his or her compass in steadfast fellowship with equal vividness. In other words, we can't love everybody here in this church family equally with the same strength. And Kelly went on to acknowledge that there are degrees of fellowship. Although all might be within the bonds of love, some are nearer to us individually than others. And some of those who are not so near to us may be nearer to someone else. And that makes various groupings within the church that kind of overlap. But Kelly sums it up this way. The total effect in a living church is sufficient intersection of loving bonds to form supporting, caring, caring network of love for the whole of humanity. And it begins with that personal <coughs> commitment that we all make to be vulnerable, to be willing to trust one another enough that we will be loved, no matter what we might have to share, no matter what we might have to hear or receive from another. When we open ourselves up to each other, there's that possibility for really serving one another and really growing deep in love and in relationship. So let's be glad for the ways we already do that and for the joyous results that follow. And let's take up the places where we maybe up to this point have failed to be as loving to one another as we ought. And let's pray that the Spirit will lead us into how we can do that. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today knowing full well that we haven't always loved perfectly. We have not done your will. But Lord, as we struggle with this 11th commandment that you've given us now, we pray, Lord, that we would open ourselves up to one another and to your spirit that you might lead us. And we pray, dear Jesus, that we might know your presence among us and that truly others will see and say, wow, how they do love one another. Lord, we commit our lives to you walk with us as we seek to walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No matter how many bulletins I grab today, they all seem to disappear. I already used the one I had up here in the back. As we respond to God's word today, we're going to sing number 77, How Great Thou Art. And today as we sing that song, if you have a prayer that is on your heart, I'd love to pray the the altar rail is open for your prayers, whether it be a, a prayer for a deeper love for your brothers and sisters in Christ or for somebody maybe in another church. The Lord is ready to hear our prayers today. Now, moving around to the prayer concerns in our baskets before we go. Let's 
stand together.